My name is Piers Kalea. I've been making films for the past 12 years that explore innovations in storytelling, different approaches to spirituality, and more recently, multicultural stories about identity, belonging, and human rights. My current project, My Room in Tehran is Called America, is a documentary feature that details a female Iranian artist's journey to a life without censorship in modern-day Iran, before and during the current female-led protests and includes interviews with other Iranian artists in diaspora who relate their journeys and reflections on what is happening in the country. Hava, a female Iranian artist, is torn between staying in a country and culture she has always known and leaving for the United States to finally be afforded a life without censorship, toiling during the day in one life and journaling at night to dream in another. The film documents her struggles, first in Iran, then Istanbul, where she waits for a visa to America. Hart's memoir, travelogue, and love story. My Room is a real-life handmaid's tale that lifts the veil on a woman faced with a difficult choice on her journey to freedom in modern-day Iran. Since this film is timely, I will be traveling in December to various places around the world for interviews. This will require a lot of funds in air travel, camera equipment rentals, and lodging expenses. Our hope is to raise at least $20,000 in support to help in this next phase of production and allow for us to capture footage as our story has grown to include an entire country's battle cry for women, life, and freedom. This journey for freedom and safety has been something I have valued greatly being an Iranian immigrant. I recognize the sacrifices my parents made coming to the United States shortly before the Islamic Revolution. I have witnessed many relatives and friends who have suffered and made incredible journeys to be afforded female autonomy, equality, freedom of speech, and a life without censorship. Since Hava has already been in limbo for the past two and a half years, and the various routes toward her potential immigration to the United States could require a prolonged wait time, offering support would greatly help both the film and the artist at this crucial time when all hope seems lost. We are also keenly aware that media representation of what has been happening in Iran has barely been broadcast in the West and that the Islamic regime itself is paying $37 million per day to prevent its citizens from having internet and sharing the horrible atrocities that are currently happening as young protesters, human rights activists, artists, and writers are being tortured, imprisoned, and killed as they fight for their freedom. Our hope is that by shining a light on Haba's story and the countless others who will share similar stories along with the protest footage in the country, that this film will bring an understanding and empathy to the dangers of totalitarianism and help all of us understand the power of freedom and the shared responsibility we have to those who do not have such rights. Thank you so much for your interest and support. It has been because of your continued lifting that these films have been made and we have had an opportunity to create dialogue and possibilities for change, empathy, and understanding. Please consider donating, sharing the link with others, and spreading the word about my room in Tehran is called America. Uh, welcome everyone to our Conversations Art and Cinema series here at Southern Illinois, Illinois University Carbondale at the School of Media Arts within the College of Arts and Media. Thank you to our esteemed guests for joining us. Uh, to get us started, I'd like to talk briefly about Masa Amini. Why has her story gripped the Ukrainian nation? What was it that made it like George Floyd in America? How could it have united all of Iran's ethnic and religious groups against the government in this way? Why now? Why not before? If anyone would like to start on that, um, and then we can see who else wants to respond. Uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit about what I do know and what I'm observing, and that is that uh, I, I think it's important to contextualize Masa Amini in a lo much longer trajectory of history of women's struggle for freedom and human rights. Um, so, you know, this didn't spring out of nowhere. Uh, women have been struggling pretty much since 1979 or 1980, at least, when the compulsory hijab laws were instituted. 
there have been many attempts to uh, address the inequalities, the gender apartheid, if you will, of Iran um, through voting, through reform movements like the One Million Signatures campaign, which took place in the early mid 2000s. And um, women have endured great humiliation daily under the hands of the morality police and also under the legal system. So I think it, it just was like the spark was Masa Amini's death. But I also think we can't escape thinking about what has just happened in Iran with COVID, uh, the effect of sanctions long term, and also um, young people are at the helm of this. They're very connected to the world through their cell phones. They know what's going on in other parts of the world, and they're frustrated by a, a very old leadership that has old thoughts. So I think it's a it's a kind of moment where everything has come together. Um, I, I think there's a lot of unity, but I don't think we know where people are going with this. And I think that's one of the things that's both um, optimistic and cause for trepidation because um, what we've already seen is the violence that the government has meted against young people. And, and as somebody who's an educator, uh, it's particularly horrific to see the attack on students. Not that it's the first time either, but, um, but I think that the level of frustration among girls and women, it's just a state of feeling, oh, I wanted to read you. <laughs> Sorry, I want to read you a quote from my cousin and then I'll shut up. Um, I keep in touch with a cousin and she was in prison for four years in between 1980 and 1985 for refusing to comply with the hijab laws. And she said in a text to me yesterday, we have tried every possible other way. We tried voting, even when there were a few acceptable candidates. The next time, there were even fewer acceptable candidates that were nominated. We have tried reform. We've tried addressing corruption, but it's a huge barrier to achieve any results. We've tried dialogues. They do not listen. They think that this is their country. They have imprisoned us. This land belongs to the people who live in it. I think there's a level of feeling like they're victims of their own government and that they're actually living in a kind of open air prison. So I'll stop there. That's my sort of read. And also getting this stuff from my cousin has been really helpful to think about the level of frustration because she was 16 years old, 43 years ago when this first started. Yes, and anybody else that wants to join in here and respond, I know there are different perspectives. Um, and Mario? Yeah, uh, first of all, I would uh, love to uh, thank you all for participating. Let's come back to the subject of Iran. Uh, my narrative, uh, because I am, I never immigrated out of Iran. I'm, I'm living there and here, and I'm already working into uh, society is now the big question is why and who is the leader? For me, the leader is the movement by itself. So why is the movement is formed uh, by uh, something really unusual by those uh, who are under pressure, they are forming, actually they form um, a new method of feminism for the first time. And uh, they are, um, you know why? Because they are suffering uh, in, in many different aspects. They have nothing to lose basically. If, if you want, I can uh, open each um, drawer and, and show you why. But they are not hopeless because they are educated. This new generation are from those mothers that they were educated, but they were suffering and they were silenced because they all the time thought, shh, 
we will lose our job. Shh, you will get out of the university. Shh. But this new generation, they do not have nothing to lose. They see uh, their fathers, their mothers lost their job, lost whatever they had, and this and that. So this is the time that they compared themselves with the whole world. Uh, you know, the, the community, I mean, the society of Iran is suffering from different things like unemployment rates. Uh, like, for example, you, th you see, uh, unemployment rate is so high and there is no job securement. And even 60% of those people who are employed, they are uh, in short-term uh, contracts and they, don't, they do not have any type of uh, insurances. So even if you have a job, it means that you don't have a job and so many different things. But something else is happening in this new generation is men who were supposed to be owner of the women, supposed to be against the women, and supposed to be uh, restrictions of the women, now they are in front, uh, in front of uh, the government, I, I know whatever we say, government or, or, or the, uh, the opposed uh, force, and they are supporting this girl. Feminism. Feminist. And another thing for the first time, you know, uh, this method of governmental system tried from the first day to make borders and separations between, um, you know, traditions, Lord, Torque, court, and this and that they tried their best to uh, create and make uh, people believe um, through jokes, through stories, through many things that uh, create and keep this separation. But right now, you know, Massa Amini is a court, is a Kurdish girl, but the whole uh, society of Iran is supporting that because they are suffering from the same problem. And if this problem do not solve in the best way, the whole world is suffering because in that place, in that uh, area, there are many different problems that we, we, we see. They are creating more wars, they are creating more problems. And of course, all of us, if we go out of the country, doesn't work at all because the whole world can um, be in trouble if they don't solve this problem right now. Well, can I say something back to the original question and then I'll jump back oh, in? Of course. I think that the um, the difference now is that, um, you know, the poverty has gotten worse. People are, you know, the, the, the situation in Iran in general has gotten worse. And this is a young generation that's really um, tuned into social media. They're a TikTok generation. They're, they're on Instagram, they're TikTok, and they're seeing the way the whole world is living their lives. lives. And they're hearing this message of empowerment over the last few years here in America. Uh, female empowerment has been a huge thing. And that has permeated the Iranian youth as well. So they're a little fearless because we've become more fearless over here. And the women here have really um, taken the bull by the horns. And I think they've inspired the world in many ways to um, also uh you know just sort of evaluate their lives based on um you know how they're being treated so here in america there there's a there's a big generation gap right there's uh sort of the millennials or or gen z versus uh the boomers and i think in iran it's kind of a similar thing they look at these octogenarian uh uh, leaders, they're all in their 80s, and, you know, that are trying to, uh, that are corrupt and taking uh, billions of dollars from the Iranian people, and the young generation know that they're getting screwed now. It's like, they're not going to stand up for it anymore. So I think the reason now is because of social media, because they're seeing all this stuff happening around the world, and they're part of that revolution. There's a paradigm shift going on. <laughs> That's why. And so are are the all are, are the fathers gonna deal with their sons and daughters in the same way? And I think that's another sort of question that you're bringing about uh, as well. I mean, they, they they see the freedom 
they see kids their old their own age you know like that poor little girl who just got killed who was like six or 17 you know singing that pop song we keep seeing her you know and how sort of westernized she was in some ways you know but at the same time being very persian like true iranian not this you know this this thing that the um sort of islamic regime wants to try to make iranians i'm talking about like the true Iranian spirit, you know, the artists, the poets, the, you know, the lovers, the, uh, you know, the so the people who celebrate life, you know, and they are in tune with Americans. Um, you know, it was interesting because Sean Penn went to Iran many years ago, and the thing he said when he came back was, out of all the countries I've ever been to anywhere, the people that I feel like I most identify with in terms of you know, being so similar to Americans is the Iranian youth. Because we do have this love for freedom and self-expression and the arts. And, uh, you know, and unfortunately, it's been hijacked by, uh, you know, obviously this regime. Well, I got to say, I don't know if I fit in this panel with all due respect. I've got so much rage in me. I got so much rage in me, I could turn this whole thing upside down. I don't know if it's my ego or it's the pain of 44 years of trauma could keep coming back every few years. Every time I hear something about Iran. So yeah, shatter me, shatter me, not just say it, because I gotta scream it. She was a person. She was a living, breathing human being. We're not talking about some imaginary person. These people, these kids, the boys don't even have whiskers on their faces. They're dying just so they could live, man. I don't know. We could keep trying to chop it up, justify it, make sense of it. They're dying just so they could live. Yeah, say her name, shout it, Serena. Nika, Ma Maso, the, I mean, Bash. say their name, remember them, these were human beings, not even 20, not even 18, not even at a legal age. I know, every morning I wake sad. up and these I see These tears them. are rage, they're not sadness, please know what this isn't the sadness, I'm filled with fucking rage, and I'm sitting here in the U.S., can't do anything but posting, posting, tagging, thinking I'm doing something. I said it. I don't know if I belong here. I'm out of my bloody mind. I'm going to quiet down. No, I'm no, you, you belong here. Right? Right? You belong here. You all belong here. I feel I feel like you do. There, It's difficult. There's so much pain. There's so much anguish. There, For all of us, we've been living this. I feel hopeless too. Like I'm not doing. What can I do? I can't do anything. All I can do is post, and it just feels like so inadequate when I think about all of those young people out there risking their lives. We're also talking about all of us in diaspora, and what can we do together? How can we support one another? And this is something I think Dr. Karim can speak about as well. Uh, okay, I'll try. Thank you, Ray, for getting enraged, because I think it is worthy of rage as a response. Um, I, you know, one of the things I feel it as a woman, too, um, because I think I put something in the chat. It's like patriarchal fascism. And don't kid yourselves if you don't think we have it here too. And I feel equally outraged by what's happened in this country in, since Trump's election in terms of the attack on uh, women, the attack on queer people, trans people. I think we have to take a lesson from these young people um, in Iran. Um, I'll, I'll try to say something intelligent. Uh, about 
supporting each other. And I think that's why it's really important to have a space like this, Ray. So I don't think you know anyone feels like you don't belong. I think you're just saying what's most immediately in your heart. I just came from a rally in San Francisco and people are pissed, you know? So um, I think it's really important that we remember, and you mentioned it, Ray, you said, I've been dealing with this for 44 years. I'm born in the US, but every step of my adult life has been punctuated by you know, pain because of people that have been jailed, separated. Nobody in my Iranian family lives in the same continent, you know, like everybody's in four different continents. Um, and so I think part of what we're dealing with is the sort of reverberations of uh, a country that has been causing so much harm to its people and to its um, extended families as well. Um, and I think one of the things that I feel, I mean, I'll say this, I think art has a huge impactful role to play. And since that's sort of where I thought we were going to talk about, I'll say that I think Iran is full of an amazing artist. And they're also, all of you are amazing artists, I'm sure. I don't know your work, but I think that's where we can say some things that can't be said in platitudes, in speeches. Um, and I've been so impressed by some of the artistic responses to the protests in Iran, both inside of Iran, but as well outside. Um, there's a call um, in my in, in the Bay Area to get creatives together to try and do things to post on billboards. Um, and also, I think, you know, like the you mentioned, Piro's the putting blood in or, you know, food coloring in the fountains, which is something they did during the Iran Iraq war, right? Um, the graffiti on the walls. I think art can be so challenging to a regime that's so deeply ideological and art cannot be ideological by its nature. So I want to encourage people to use their artistic abilities. I mean, I'm sure you guys have been watching people sing Shervin Hajipur's anthem. I saw it today. I couldn't believe there was a crowd of probably 800 people singing that song today in front of the city hall in San Francisco. Um, I think people are inspired by these young people, and I think young people in Iran are inspiring each other. Oh, I see we're going to play it, so I'm going to let you play it, because we're getting near the end anyway. خواهرم خواهرت خواهرامون برای تغییر مغز ها که پوسیدن برای شرمندگی برای بی پولی برای حسرت یک زندگی معمولی برای کودک زبال گرد و آرزو هاش برای این اقتصاد دستوری برای این هوای آلوده برای ولی از شد رختای فرسوده برای پیروز و اعتمال انقرازش برای سگهای بیگناه ممنوعه برای گریه های بیوقفه برای تصویر تکرار این لحظه برای چهره ای که میخنده برای دانش آموزا برای هاینده برای این بهشت اجباری برای نخبه های زندانی برای کودکان افغانی برای این همه برای غیر تکراری برای این همه شعار های تو خالی برای آوار خونه های پوشالی پس از شبای طولانی برای غرصای حساب و بیخوابی برای مرد میهن آبادی برای دختری که آرزو داشت به سر بود برای زن زندگی آزادی